always on mute. Uh, my name is Lisa McCracken. I'm one of the part-time staff members. I'm sure you know Jess and Todd better than me. Um, I'm just here running the recording and welcoming you all. Um, but of course, our board president, Lisa Pistelli, is the real queen of the show here. <laughs> um, oh, no, seriously. You guys do so much. We're just here helping out. <laughs> I just want to welcome you all today. Thanks so much for coming. Um, tell you a little bit about what we've got going on. Let's see. Do, do, do. Lisa, did you want to? Mm. I do. So I, I'm going to official, officially welcome all of you to MACMA's uh, presentation today with Ruth Stevens, Barbara Falk, having a fantastic conversation on retention and engagement. Um, I think that you are going to find a huge value out of this and I'm excited for this to be happening. And as we like to say at MACMA, hashtag where the conversation happens, um, you won't find this anywhere else. And I'm so honored that Ruth is here. So we're excited to have her. So um, the other exciting things coming up from MACMA that we will continue to talk about is um, on April 29th, there is another event. Um, it's gonna be a discussion about what AI means to you. And that will be with Joanne Persico of One Count and uh, Dennis Hecht, who is with Seven Nuts Digital. So that'll be exciting. And then more bigger and live and in person for the first time in almost two years, I'm not even sure how long, we will be having MACMA Day live and in person um, in Newark at the Hilton Newark Airport on May 12th. Uh, there's lots of information on the website. If you have questions, please email me. Um, some of the people today are on the panels for that day, and we're so excited to have them and honored. We hope you can all be there. So I think without further ado, other than to thank um, our sponsors, mm -hmm. um, and oh, sorry, I jumped, Lisa. I'm sorry. Well, well first of all, let, let me remind everybody to renew or join with a membership to uh, MACMA today. So um, keep in mind, a virtual membership is $45 a year. And we would, you'll be able to access all of the virtual events. Obviously, MACMA Day will be a little bit more and separate, but we're looking forward to it. Um, any questions, email me, help at the mcma.org or at the macma.org. They all work. Um, and plus on the website as well. So, and what else do we have, please? Uh, oh, social media, please like me, comment, share. Like, comment, share, as we like to say. Um, the YouTube uh, site will have all of the links to all of the educational sessions, including today. So we invite you to take a look there. We're excited for that. And last but not least, we want to thank our sponsors. Here they are. So we want to give a shout out to CDS, Palm Coast Data, Strategic Fulfillment Group, Auditive Data Axel, Lester, Omita, the Progress Network, and the Simex Group. There's too many silver sponsors to mention. The bronze sponsors as well. Thank you all. We're so grateful. And there might be a special thanks. I don't know who I'm thanking next, but I'll find out other than Ruth. <laughs> so keep up to date here, the macma.org. There's the website. And I think we might be ready to turn it over to Barbara Falk, who is going to introduce Ruth and we can all learn. And I'm so excited for all of it. So let's go ahead. Okay, great. Well, welcome everybody. I'm glad you could join us today. I want to introduce Ruth Stevens. Um, she's an industry leader and a consultant to countless organizations. She's also a, a, um, a podcaster. I'm like looking at my notes here. Um, an author and an adjunct professor. She's currently um, actually, as we speak now, in Krakow, Poland. And I'm just always amazed with being virtual that you would think Ruth was like in the next room or sitting right next to me because it's so clear. Um, she's there for the month of April teaching a B2B digital marketing uh, course at, and I, I apologize if I say this incorrectly, Jagiolian University, their management school. Did I get that right? It's Jagiellonian. Jagiellonian, okay. My Polish roots are not. <laughs> <laughs> My Polish ancestors are sort of cringing with the way I pronounce that. Um, 
I had the opportunity to go and hear Ruth present a webinar probably back in late 2020. And it was actually about um, reimagining B2B marketing during COVID and beyond. And I was at a point where, you know, I was, I was been home working from home for many months and I was just looking for any types of opportunities to participate in webinars just to feel like connected with people. And at the time I said, well, this sounds interesting, but it doesn't really apply to me because while I started my career in B2B marketing, I was in B2C marketing or even C2C marketing. And I'll listen to it, but I don't think I'm going to get much out of it. And it really resonated with me. My, uh, my takeaways were that it was really necessary to have a shift in messaging. Um, and in, there was an increased necessity for innovation and personalization. So even though this was really from uh, presented to B2B marketers, it was applied to all marketers. And um, so I'm just going to let Ruth take it from there. Well, great. Thank you. And um, I certainly remember that that session. And wasn't it a terrible time when we were trying to figure out how to handle COVID mm -hmm. um, in our professional and, of course, our personal lives? Um, I, I'm much more encouraged these days, as I'm sure everyone is. So I'm going to um, share my screen. Could I, um, I guess, I, I guess I just have control here. So I'm going to go ahead and do it. Um, and let's see. I'm going to pull up my slides here. Sorry, everybody, this is a little awkward there. Um, hope you can see my slides, but more important, can I ask, is, is the sound okay? Because I made some adjustments, good to hear. Yes. Okay, thanks. So, um, so to dive right in, I was asked to talk by Barbara about retention and, and engagement marketing. And so these are the topics I'm gonna cover and make sure that I don't throw too much at you and keep to the time, the time schedule. But this is really one of my favorite topics because oddly, many companies are focusing too much on new customer acquisition or prospecting and too little on keeping their current customers engaged and, and, um, and profitable which mystifies me because you get a lot more profitability from an existing customer <laughs> versus a new customer, right? I mean, it's just sort of um, obvious, but for some reason we all get focused on prospecting and, and forget where the money really <laughs> is. So I'm gonna try to pitch you on why retention marketing is worth your, worth your while and also then um, get into some really tactical methods for, for taking advantage of it. So let me, let me just keep going. It, my favorite marketing theorist is Peter Drucker and mainly because he said this brilliant thing that what we're really about in business is getting and keeping customers. Um, so, you know, I follow his, his logic and I'm, I'm thrilled that a lot of research has been done on this subject, especially since the arrival of the, uh, Reichelt's book, Frederick Reichelt's book in the mid eighties, where he was really the first to demonstrate the financial value of investing in retention. And then, then there have been several others who have echoed the same message with a slightly different approach. Yeah, so if you ever need to take forward a retention marketing program and try to persuade your colleagues and get budget for it, the, these data points I think will help. But um, the, uh, what I'd, I'd really like to begin with is a discussion among all of us with um, the chance to hear from you 
about your experience with a company that you already do business with or have done business with happily as a consumer now, as yourself. And let's just talk about what do we mean by retention? What do we mean by loyalty? What's been your experience? Do you, is this company, do you feel loyal to them? And if so, how do you know? <laughs> you know? maybe because you're buying from them all the time, or maybe it's something else. And think about what they've maybe done deliberately to try to keep you buying or keep you loyal. Uh, I'd love to see your thoughts in the chat. Would, would you all mind um, dropping in some, some comments in the chat? Um, I'm, seeing, I'm seeing Amazon Prime from Joanne. It's a those guys have really mastered. I, I've got an example later uh, of some of the techniques they're following to keep their customers happy and, and buying. So Emma's saying it's about quality product. No kidding. Yeah, really, all the marketing in the world is not going to overcome a bad product, right? <laughs> Free shipping, yes, thanks, Joanne. That's always a, a favorite. So, Roberta, you're saying it's your local pharmacy, Apple, yep, service. Isn't that interesting? We're so often it's service sna snafus that really annoy us and get us to start looking for an alternate source. It's it, it and I'm I'm going to talk a, a bit about that too because. Solving customer service problems is really the job one in, in the retention effort. We'll see that being, uh, having your seller know you, uh, that is so true, Barb. You appreciate, but everybody knows your name. Wait, <laughs> forget my little reference to the cheers bar, but it's, um, it, it's certainly a reason to keep coming back. Um, and uh, Lisa is saying that price, if she doesn't like the price, she'll go elsewhere. Definitely, we're all motivated that way, aren't we? Yeah, so good. Thanks for those inputs. Um, as I said in my, my first introduction to you all, uh, it, it's remarkable how few marketing departments are focused heavily on retention. In B2B environments, most of account penetration and account management is done out of a sales function and marketing isn't really involved. In fact, um, if, if you look at, this is B2B data here, but if, if you look at um, what, what marketers say is their priority uh, in the B2B world, it's leads. I, I see data really annually that suggests that 85% of B2B marketing budgets are devoted, I'm sorry, not budgets, effort are devoted to new customer acquisition and only 15% is devoted to retention. And I would argue that, that if anything, that should be turned upside down <laughs> because it, costs you money to get a new customer and it's your current customers where you're really going to accrue those profits. So uh, here's some more data that suggests that marketers are beginning to realize that. Uh, I was encouraged that in this example, in, in this survey, I think this is also B2B, um, the 32% um, of companies were focusing on cross-selling and 19 on retain, retention. So that's a lot better than the prior survey I shared. So maybe, maybe we're going in that direction. But let, let's talk a little bit about what retention really means. And I bring this up because there's a, a lot of confusion and actually a, a lot of valid opinions and, and arguable points on this. But I'd like to propose that the ultimate definition of retention is that they're, they're continuing to buy. And 
um, and you might argue that uh, that they are referring to referring you to others is a valid um, definition of retention, and I, I can certainly argue that. But I would also argue that simple satisfaction is not the definition of retention. It can be a driver, but what we're really talking about is churn. You know that you're you're not losing a customer. You're keeping them and presumably continuing to develop the relationship. And um, we'll talk about this later too, but zero churn is not necessarily a goal. In fact, it's, it's very unlikely there are going to be customers who, whom you can't serve profit, profitably and you may want to get rid of them. So, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm gonna go for those um, those definitions and maybe after I've finished with this talk, we, we can argue about some of these because I, I recognize that they're a bit controversial. But I would, I, I would argue that there's a, a way to think about your strategy in retention marketing is to think about it the, the way a salesperson would think about his or her customer. You know how salespeople are. They know perfectly well how to get to know their customers really deeply, understand their needs, you know, be friends with them, uh, go play golf, you know, <laughs> understand how they want to be sold to and respect that and, and treat them that way. And also to keep, keep an eye on the market because, you know, they're out selling against their competitors all the time. So we want to make sure that our value proposition is still strong and, and um, attractive. So considering retention marketing programs, they, they will probably, the best ones anyway, are going to fit into this kind of, of um, uh, form, not formula, but a framework. So let me dive into these seven retention, I'm calling them strategies, but they're really you could also call them tactics. And I've got seven of them. So let's begin with the first one. I'm sorry, this slide is pretty busy, but I'm, I'm going to begin with the single most important retention driver. And that is that you deliver on what, you, what, what they thought they were going to get. And sometimes we can't really manage their expectations. We've somehow given them the wrong impression of what they're gonna get. But the, the best um, approach in retention marketing is to do great product management, great customer selection, and, um, and a differentiated product that is better than the competition. So it's really doing good business is the, the, the first, thing that has to has to be considered before you even start thinking about any program. And then the second thing which I mentioned earlier is if anything goes wrong, you need to fix it. And uh, I think all of us have been had problems with even our beloved vendors or suppliers um, and Yet, if we love them, we'll give them a lot of leeway. But ultimately, if our problems are not resolved, we're going to look elsewhere. It's just how we behave, especially if it's a competitive environment and we have a lot of alternatives. So um, th these two things, meeting and exceeding customer expectations and solving problems that, that customers may have, are not the sole purview of a marketing department. So um, for us as marketers, um, we need to be thinking like CEOs and we also need to be taking these points to our senior management to persuade them that all the marketing communications and, and tactics in the world are, are not going to help if these two fundamentals are, are missing. So. Um, I'm, I'm sure you're, you're, you're feeling the same way. A um, couple of fun points that I'd like to share with you, even though it's totally counter in, uh, counterintuitive, 
it's been shown statistically that generating complaints actively is to be encouraged. And nobody wants to do this. The last thing we want to do is hear complaints, not only from our spouses, but from our customers. But it's been shown that if you proactively solicit complaints and fix them, you will actually have a better retention rate than if they didn't have a problem in the first place. And um, I, I could share with you uh, later some data to back that up. But um, this is the counterintuitive thing that we have to really uh, consider and, and act on, in my opinion. Another brilliant strategy for keeping in touch with customers is to create an advisory board. I don't know how many of you have tried this in your companies. It doesn't cost much. It doesn't take much time. But once a, a customer has been asked to give you advice about how you can do better, first of all, that customer is going to be more loyal himself or herself. Just being asked is so satisfying. But also you get, you can get really ongoing, um, not necessarily objective, but at least on the ground advice. And it's so much better. It's not necessarily statistically projectable, but it's much more intimate and deep and emotional than what you would get from you know, market research. So that's a, a tactic that I, I've seen really success with and, and would recommend it to you. OK, the third one is to focus on penetration marketing. And this is an area, you know, when we think about retention marketing, we think about loyalty points and rewards. But it retention marketing is it begins, I think, with dear old upselling and cross-selling. And depending on how your business is structured and who's in charge of the customer relationship after that customer has been acquired, um, the, those people need to think deeply about how they can expand the value of the customer relationship. And here's uh, several of the, the strategies that make sense there. Um, if you're in a B2B environment and you've got a, an account management team in charge of the customer penetration or expansion, then a marketing team can step in and add extra arms and legs to assist that relationship. Um, but only if the senior executives, especially the CMO, have understood that they need to assign marketing um, resources to the retention function. So I, you know, I'm always kind of waving the flag for, for that. Okay, on to the fourth topic. And this is simply, I mean, it seems so obvious, but um, it's remarkable how if you pay a little bit of attention to why customers leave or defect, you can actually find out that there were signals that you might have missed, especially if you have a database of customer interactions, a CRM system, or a, a, another type of customer management system. And if you analyze the prior behavior of defected customers, you can really find triggers that, or signals that will allow you to take action and prevent further defections. Uh, I've got a couple of examples here. One classic example is known as latency. If you're in a category where customers buy regularly, like one of my favorite examples is a hair salon. <laughs> if I'm running a hair salon and my customers are coming in every six weeks and it gets to be the seventh week and I haven't seen them, hmm, that's a red flag. I might want to give them a call or you know check in in some, some manner. Um, another a, another uh, very common strategy is um, if you see that um, customers are taking a lot of time getting service, 
that might be a red flag as well, where you want to see if there's an underlying problem that is needs to be fixed, not just the immediate customer service problem. And there are plenty of other defection prevention strategies that you can pursue. Okay, on to number five. This is known as, well, lots of ways of, of referring to it, but generically you might call it continuous relationship selling where very similar to a subscription, which I know you guys are all, deeply familiar with, this is taking whatever uh, sales environment you're in and figuring out whether you can eliminate some of the, uh, the, the new acquisition or the, um, the, the penetra account penetration or re-up expense by turning the relationship into an automatic one and some there are several businesses for which this is an automatic it's kind of part of their business model pharmaceuticals media of course um, software as a service telecom insurance you know all of these are, are set up where you don't have to sell them again and even amazon you can see in the lower right i sort of pulled out a a photo of how Amazon has embraced this idea of, of um, subscribe and save. There are no dummies. So, um, and it's remarkable how business categories that you would never have thought could be turned into a subscription can be. I I was seeing a um, a a business where they were selling a set of pots and pans, and they converted it. They sold one piece. And it, they basically made a continuity program out of it that, you know, if you don't let us know, you'll get the second piece of the set next month. That kind of dear old continuity program worked really well. Um, and then the, the sixth idea that I have to share with you is dear old rewards. <laughs> and we all are familiar with these from consumer markets. As consumers, we... You know, we're all members of frequent flyer programs and, and so forth. Um, lots of ways these can be structured. It's been, and there's a lot written about rewards programs and loyalty programs. So I can't cover all the great stuff that's out there here. But one thing that I've always found kind of also counterintuitive is that the rewards do not need to be financial. They can be things like special treatment, you know, intangible benefits like having your call get to the front of the line and all those um, things that so many of us have benefited from, like check, free bag check on an airline. Now in B2B, consumer style points just are very rare and they usually don't work except in categories like say construction when you're buying plumbing supplies and um, there's lots of frequency of purchase but uh, in most b2b environments if a seller tries to reward a buyer they're constrained from actually taking any personal rewards the it's against company policy and it well should be because it could be a, a, a source of corruption right but um, this is where ser special service levels can really step in and reward the repeat purchase from a, a business buyer, uh, especially if the service level is applied at the account level versus the individual level. So now we're finally at the seventh point. But before we do, I thought it would be fun just to see one of my favorite cartoons. This will take a minute for you to read, but this is kind of overdoing it on the loyalty program front. So I'll give you a few minutes to check this out. Pretty funny, huh? Isn't that great? So <laughs> we all so need, some, need some humor here and there. And we've all been subject to this, I think. 
So I'm going to wrap up with just a few more points. Um, I've got my seventh item to share with you. This is actually one of my favorites. It's called customer win back. And this is trying to get a customer who's defected to come back into the fold. Um, you know, no matter how good we are, sometimes we lose a customer. And here's, I've got these, these three steps that I, I've condensed from really the best book on the subject by uh, a PhD named Michael Lowenstein, who wrote a book called Customer Win Back. And I've boiled it down to three, point, three key points where first you examine whether you really want the customer back. As I said earlier, there are some customers that we simply can't service profitably. Um, maybe they, like I had an example from a, uh, a bank that was spending, it's an online bank and they were spending more money taking customer service calls from customers for whom online banking was really kind of weird and unfamiliar and that, and they were spending more handling the phones than they were earning from that customer. So in fact, the, the president in, in this example was, I think a, a little bit, he, I don't think he really should have said this in public, but he was quoted in the newspaper as saying, if such customers are identified, we, um, it, we invite them to go to another bank. <laughs> and I was thinking, hmm. I don't know if that's if I would say it quite that way, but certainly um, you might want to raise your fees and bring the customer into profitability that way or let them leave on their own rather than firing them. So then the second step is to figure out what went wrong and of course try to fix the problem. And that was point number two, right back there in, in uh, the, uh, the list of tactics. But then the third point is, the one that I think will be of interest to you and maybe new to you. In, on the business to business side, they have learned that if you're going to have a function devoted to trying to bring customers back, they, it needs to be organized and compensated differently from your regular sales and marketing department because it's hard <laughs> and the conversion rates are going to be low and the sales cycle is going to be long. So you're, you're, and they're also going to be depressed because it's going to be hard to prevent, to, to uh, persuade these customers to come back, especially in technical fields where they've, you know, it, it, there, there's a lot of barriers to bringing in a new vendor. So, um, the, but th as a process, win back can be, in a highly profitable activity, because if they were happy with you once, the chances are three times higher that they'll continue to be happy, or happy with you than a, a customer that you're acquiring for the first time. So generally, except for customers whom you can't serve profitably, it's a good idea to invest in WinBack. So let me now go to a quick list of retention tactics that have proven their worth in a lot of uh, marketing situations, both in consumer and business markets. And most of, of the programs that you see involve one or more of, of these tactics. So that's a kind of checklist for you. And then I'd also like to mention briefly the subject of reactivation. There's um, the, you know, I, I talked about win back as one of the seven strategies, but here are some of the tactics, the marketing tactics behind successful win back. It's about speed and having access to the information you need and using pretty standard marketing strategies like like research and segmentation, making sure your data is correct and things like that. So my, and my, la my last topic is about measuring retention success. 
And like defining retention, <laughs> there are some arguable points here. I, um, I would argue that the, the four metrics that I've included here are good ones to uh, declare success by. There are a lot of people who use metrics like customer satisfaction. And I, I say, wait a minute, <laughs> just because they're satisfied doesn't mean they're buying as deeply and richly as, as they could be. So, um, and loyalty is another metric that if, if you survey your customers and say, are you loyal to our company? And they all say, yes, well, that doesn't mean they're necessarily buying. I mean, we're in business, we wanna make sure that we're accruing maximum value to our shareholders, our owners. So what people say is not necessarily what people do as we all know. So I, I would look for more business oriented metrics to, um, by which to prove to senior management that you, you are, your retention efforts are paying off and here are a couple of uh, approaches that have been successful in retention marketing, looking at the return rate or the churn rate or whatever metric you've chosen against yourself over time. So you say our churn rate last year was this and it's 5% lower after we introduced our new programs or fixed various problems. Um, and the other thing you can do is, is measure yourself against your industry. There are many industry associations, Lisa, I'm sure you're thinking about this, that do benchmarking for, so that all industry members can get a, a sense of what the data is like across the industry. So then you could say, well, um, how am I doing against others in my field? Am I, is, are my retention rates lower or higher? And that's a, a, also a wonderful way to keep, um, the, your, keep yourself honest about the success of your retention programs. So that's it. And I think we have quite a bit of time, Barb, to, to talk. I'm inviting you all to um, connect with me on LinkedIn anytime. And um, I, with that, I think we're ready to open up. Is that right, Barb? Is, are you going to conduct yes. a? Mm -hmm. So thanks everybody for listening. I hope that wasn't too, too, whatever, boring. <laughs> no, was, this was this was great, great, and it was, you know, just what I expected um, from that Wonderful. original presentation that you that you shared um, a year and a half ago. I'd like to add one thing that. Um, about sort of engagement and retention that I found to be important. And that is, Please, I'd love I to make sure it. that, especially if it's something that is a little bit more of a, a complicated process or a product or something that you can lose people if they don't understand how to use it. And you want to make sure early on that your customers know how to use your product. And even, you know, if it's um, a newsletter or a magazine or something with a digital component or video or website, and you want to make sure that they know what to do when they get there, that they know that, they, you know, how to, how to um, set up an account, what they can access, what's available to them. Because if, if they don't, um, that will often be why someone is no longer loyal or just sort of drops off as well, I don't even know how to use this. I'm glad you brought that up. And I love what Matt said here about um, zero loyalty to the cable provider, but he keeps paying every month. It's nothing like a monopoly, right? To encourage. Although with cord cutting, he does have other options. So, I any, 
I thought that the part where, you know, loyalty doesn't equal retention. I thought that was amazing. I, I just never thought about it that way, that it's not one of those core principles. I really thought that that was an interesting way to look at it. Um, I think that a lot of the proven tactic, you know, the tactics that you've listed are, are, are um, part of every day, at least for me. In, in what I've been doing for a number of years is, is those tactics, you know, of, of doing as much as you can for your customer um, as quickly as possible. Um, and I think that you're between that and, and as obviously as quickly as possible, but it's the win back idea. You know, we've been using win backs um, and Barb, please help me with this, you know, in consumer, you know, consumer marketing for anything. So either for, you know, publications, for events, for, for, for literally past attendees of events, we, we've created campaigns across the board for multiple different clients to use that, well, we missed you, you were there three years ago, we'd love for you to come back to this event um, and offered some specific, maybe a, a discount or something like that. So do you think winbacks with incentives are a little bit more of a, of a boost to, to bring someone back? And you know, Roberta, maybe you can talk about that in, in you know, the events world. Do you see that um, being as, as, you know, something that an incentive helps bring them back to attend, obviously not in the pandemic world, but in a normal universe if we all lived in one? I think definitely even in a pandemic world, the, the win backs definitely help because okay. the, the new acquisition is tough, you know, um, and I find even in our company, too, we are always focused on new names, new names, database. It's like, it's like, it's all people are ever focused on. But I, I agree with you, too, Lisa, I, the, the retention and it's so much. I feel like the win backs are like low hanging fruit. And if we spent a little more time focusing on those, it's, it's much easier, um, less, and it's, um, it costs less, but definitely in the event world. Um, I know our events team um, always looks at the win backs first. They're always going through who was here, who didn't attend last year, who didn't attend two years ago, and, and why haven't they attended? And let's reach out with personal messaging um, doing, doing um, modal specifically to them, doing email specifically to them, personal messages, personal reach outs. And those seem to be really uh, popular too, um, which are helpful just to get the win backs, but they're neglected people and we love, we should love them because like <laughs> you said, they loved us first. <laughs> right, and, and we really need to go and, and make them feel important um, I, I recently saw a posting that's saying that customer acquisition costs increased roughly 60% um, for B2B and B2C companies. And I don't know in what time frame. I imagine at least the last year or so um, for a lot of different reasons. But I, I mean, I just remember that when I started out in the publishing world, the focus was always on acquisition, like bringing in someone new, because of course people are going to renew. Like we don't need to pay a whole lot of attention. Just get them a wet, just get them the renewal, they'll renew. And much less of a focus on, and, and again, to what Ruth was saying, a lot more of our budgets were applied towards acquisition and not nearly as much towards retention. And I remember that I had subscribed to a magazine back in maybe like 2003, 2004. And when it came time to renew, I actually got a premium. And it was like, I think it was a food magazine and I got like um, a kitchen magnet. And I thought, wow, that's actually really um, clever. Like I've never seen getting a premium for renewing, like thanking me for my loyalty, thanking me for being a customer. And because we spend so much time with premiums and all of that, trying to get people on the file, you know, at the lowest rate possible and throw all these other things in and then just ignore them after that. And, and really, those are the ones who are the most, it's true, they are the most profitable, but you can't just assume they're going to stay with you. I, I think something... it's because nobody's loyal anymore. I mean, think about it. Yeah. Really, we're 
nobody's really that loyal anymore. Sorry, someone was speaking. Emma. Uh, oh, I was going to say, I had something to add to this conversation in that we are doing campaigns for winbacks just to give a little context. We're not selling a paid subscription. It's free. It's controlled. Um, and same with like our online content, like we're not selling anything. We just need their data so we can use that for advertising dollars. And we see success with the win back campaigns and the soon to lose people campaigns. And then what we struggle the most with is continuing to retain their loyalty with the editorial content. And our you know, editorial director always says, <laughs> it's not fair because audience development, my team gives them um, you know, filet mignon, and then they give them ground beef. So there's like kind of a disconnect because we're doing these fun, flashy, you know, free PDF, premium content, or take this quiz and like, you know, these fun things. And then there's such a disconnect with, I think sometimes the, the product that it is that we're selling. Um, so I don't know if anyone else struggles with that, but that's always like, we can, we win people back and then we lose them. And so we can't just keep winning people back and losing that, <laughs> they have to want to stay. Do you think it's a product problem, Emma? I, I mean, candidly, I do, um, but, you know, there's only so much the audience development team can do because I'm not the one who's writing the articles. I'm the one who's writing the email campaigns for retention and new name acquisition. So it's, you know, I think yeah. it's always about breaking down silos and seeing how the teams can work together, but it's the struggle. <laughs> yeah, like I said, all the marketing in the world will not overcome a yes. product that <laughs> people don't want. Yes. So true. Oh my God. <laughs> so, so Mara, you got to chime in. I'm dying to know what the magazine is. What magazine did you, did you let lapse? Because I, I deal with this. I, I put this off all the time. The week, okay. And you're happy with it? It's amazing. Good. So... I think it's fascinating how, you know, this, this, it's such a dynamic and it's really, I love, I love what, who, who's about how it make you feel, how they make, like Barb, what you said, how did they make you feel? And I think that was in, in a little bit, but does that tie into loyalty, Ruth, or is it still the value you're feeling valued as a customer? Does you think that that is um, the, the impetus, the, the reason that they'll keep coming back now that they feel like they're, they're a little bit more valued? Yeah, it, it's it's interesting thinking about why people buy um, or do other economically beneficial things like refer their friends or or you know become an influencer or whatever. Um, and I think the psychologists would tell us that it's a combination of emotion and practicality. The, you know, fun, it's both functional and it's emotional. And, you know, I'm not smart enough to know which is which, but um, certainly all of that stuff is testable. You know, we can set up, I mean, all, all of you guys are doing tests, right? Where you set up a headline or a, a, uh, a copy theme that's more emotional and one that's more functional and, you know, see, see, see what kind of result you get. But human beings are complicated. <laughs> well, I, I actually did a, a test of the campaign which played on emotion, where it was um, because part of the retention we do um, donor, you know, cold donor mailings, and so this was for a business type of publication where um, we do cold donor mailings twice a year. We did one in the fall, and, and that was obviously a larger one, and then one in the spring. And the messaging had always been, you know, buy a gift, um, Mother's Day, Father's Day, graduation. And, and the campaign did okay. I mean, but I said, why don't we play on people's emotions? Because I had recently attended a focus group with long-term subscribers who said to them, they had been long-term because when they started in business, they were told to read this, this publication mm -hmm. and someone taught them how to read it. They had like a mentor who sat with them and taught them. So I said, well, let's try to do this. You know, yes, this is many years later, but like, let's try to, to, to test out um, our spring cold donor campaign 
based on emotion. And so it was mentor a rising star. So it went from the messaging of Mother's Day, Father's Day, graduation to mentor a rising star. Remember how you felt the first time you read this and that someone sat with you and taught you how to, to, um, to read this and learn from it. And now it's your turn to sort of pay it back. Wow, how did, <laughs> how did, how did it work? It increased response by 46%. I'm ready to wow. renew just hearing that. And that was, just, <laughs> and you know, and then what, what we did on top of it was we were able to do a Starbucks gift card. So when you, when you bought the subscription for somebody else, you got a $10 Starbucks gift card so that you could go and then sit over a cup of coffee and talk about the publication and how to, you know, what they needed to look for. Because again, playing on the emotions, subscribers were saying that um, the, the magazine would come in the mail or be hand delivered on Saturday morning and they'd be waiting with their coffee at 10 a.m. Saturday morning for it to be delivered. So that's how important it was to them. So here it was, okay, you know, have a cup of coffee with somebody that you want to go and share this with. And it, it you know, I was, I was happily surprised. I mean, I was ha very happy that it worked so well. And I didn't think that for people who are really in the business, in more of a business setting, that emotion would play into it, but it did. That's really wonderful story. I also okay. like what I also like about that story, Barb, is that you picked up an idea that worked years ago, but had kind of fallen by the wayside. I, I remember when I worked at Book of the Month Club, there was this one creative director, Michael Maroney, who was the kind of library mental repository of all tests that had ever been done in the prior 30 years or something. And he, he would come up with ideas from the past and we would test them and they would work. It was amazing because things, it might've tested out over time because things get stale yes. and needed to just needed to be reintroduced. Amazing. I think I think the whole cycle of, of being a customer, the customer journey, you know, when you do first get get in, you know, pick pick whatever it is, whether it, you know, here I'll give you a great example. A friend of mine gifted me with um, a candle of the month subscription. Hmm. Okay, I had no idea it was a birthday present. Okay, so I have to say it's actually a really nice thing to do. They they throw in extra things every month into this box. And it's like a little extra surprise that I didn't expect. And I've actually turned around and regifted it. Plus, if she doesn't really know for my birthday, I might actually do it myself because it's like a really nice little boost for yourself. And I don't know if we're actually, you know, and, 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 I, and I say this one time online, you know, you take care of yourself. You know, maybe, maybe that one little extra boost, it makes, maybe I will be loyal, even though it's not supposed to be retention, but maybe the, eff the effort that they put in by putting that extra little gift in. So it was, it was like a little vial of perfume or these um, face pads or whatever, or um, something else. But maybe that that is what drives the retention roots. You know, I don't know that I'm loyal because of anything, but I like that little extra give. Um, I think that, that, that maybe that breeds retention as well. I mean, it could be the same thing with like extra copies or an extra book, or you know, a supplement in an issue, something like that. I think maybe maybe that's the a newer equivalent of or a new contributor to retention. Yep. Just a surprise and delight is always a exactly surprise and delight. I like that. I'll keep that. Surprise. I think Donna had a question or wanted to say something. What I was going to add to what Lisa was just saying, because I'm on the B2B very specific niche area. And so there's not as much gift giving like what Lisa was just talking about, but we do it in regards to valuable content. So if we get to know the subscribers, because they're industry specific subscribers, they're getting the magazine, but we start to segment them like a, spe a specific industry, whether automotive, medical, or energy, if a new article pops up, we make sure that they get it 
and they get it via social media channels or a direct email from the president of the company, just reinforcing that, yes, they have the knowledge in their space, but they truly care to have them as subscribers. Because, you know, like you were just talking about, Ruth, it's all about relationships and showing these people that you care. And if they feel like they care and you have the information that they need, they're going to stay with you forever. And that has to happen to the subscribers they already have, not just prospects. Madonna, I think that's a great example. I think that's a really great example, but I, I have to say uh, with your tag, uh, Ruth, thank you so much. It's always great to see you. And your class is always Joanne. phenomenal. Um, but uh, you. Your, you know, the tactics, when you talked about segmentation and cleaning up the data and these insights at the end of the day, I think it's I important. I knew you were going to listen to that, Joanne. It, of course it caught my ear. <laughs> hey, it's hey. like, how can you, how can you personalize? <laughs> how can you personalize content Indeed. and offer or it. messaging? unless you have the full holistic insights of what that relationship is across all your touch points. So that's it. No, thank absolutely. you. Absolutely. Yeah. Jo and I, oh, yeah. just to no, Joanne's point, that's why companies have to start doing that on the front end. Mm -hmm. and, and people will say, oh, but Donna, it's going to take too much time. But I think they'll see, they'll retain people, which Ruth, you pointed out, if you retain them, it's a lot less expensive to retain customers than to get new ones. It's, it's less on the back end. So time-wise, you're still talking about the same amount of time. You're just reinforcing your brand and you're holding them. Here, here. And Barb, and this is to my friend Barb's comment, you know, it is, it is always about going above and beyond. Um, mm -hmm. And Joanne, by Joanne had to jump off. Um, so does anyone have any other comments? Anything else I'd like to say? We're good. Ruth, thank you. Good. So thank much. you so much. Uh, really enjoyed Barbara, it. Barbara, Ruth, thank you everybody.